Thanks for coming out to LibertyCon now, as they call it, right? Uh, it's a group branding of uh, Students for Liberty. And I've seen you here, what, four years in a row <laughs> already. I think last year I was not here because there was very bad oh, weather right. in D.C. and I ended up making it halfway here and then having to go back again. That's right. I was like uh, wondering where, like, where you were. Uh, there was like a whole tree right in front of the hotel that kind of smashed into someone's car. Uh, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of crazy. Well, yeah, good for you then. Not making it out here. Well, this is, I think, at least the third or maybe the fourth one I've been at over the last six years or five years or something. I haven't kept exact track, but I generally enjoy Liberty Con. Right. It's an interesting group of friendly people. Uh, it's got a higher ratio of women to men than most libertarian activities. And since, <laughs> in my view, organizations work better if they are somewhere not too far off 50-50, because that saving the world faces a public good problem, right. that if I save the world, I have to share the benefit with you, so I have an inadequate incentive to do it. And a lot of the way that political organizations solve that is by side benefits, and one of the major side benefits is socially interacting with people who have a lot in common with you, and that works better if the number of men and women isn't too di far different because a large majority of the people are interested in pairing up with a member of the opposite sex. So I would think the libertarian movement would be healthier if it had more women in it. And SFL hasn't done as well as I'd like, but it's done better than most other libertarian oh, organizations. Right. Yeah, I've been to other ones as well. Uh, you've also attended other interesting events like uh, Penzik. And I think it's uh, interesting because when I was reading about your interest in like medieval times, you have an interesting uh, a taste for medieval recipes. And I also heard at one point, somehow you declare war on yourself, on your own kingdom. That, that's the usual version of the story, <laughs> but like most oral history, it is not worth the paper it isn't written on. Uh, I had been king of one SCA kingdom. I moved to another. Uh, while there, essentially as a visitor, I arranged for my successor in the Middle Kingdom to authorize me to declare war on the East Kingdom, which I did. I then won the crown of the East Kingdom, so when I fought the war, it was as king of the east, whereas when I declared it, it was as ex-king of the middle. Right. So the simplified version makes a good story, but it's not actually accurate, but it was a lot of fun. Do you uh, involve yourself in the uh, pitch battles? Not anymore. <laughs> uh, yes. I stopped doing SCA combat, I suppose, I don't know, four or five years ago, something like that, at the point when I got a metal plate in my head after some surgery. Right. Uh, and I hadn't been doing much for a while. And I was never really very good at the group fighting. I was very good a long time ago at single combat, which is how I got to be king of various things, because yeah. that's how they choose the, sing the kings, uh, although I certainly wouldn't be competitive at my present age. Uh, but I was never very good at paying attention to many things at once, which is what you have to do in melees, in group fighting. So uh, I, certainly I participated in large battles with you know, hundreds of people, at least on a side, right. back before I quit uh, fighting. Uh, but it's not something that I really was very interested in as opposed to the single combat, which was a lot of fun. Right. <laughs> so you did one-on-one -on -one combat. Yeah. That's, that's pretty cool. What were you, like, uh, like having, like, the broadsword or a bastard the, sword? The, the most common form and what I mostly did is sword and shield. So you have a one-handed sword and one hand and a shield on the other arm. And the way the SCA does it, is an attempt to recreate uh, medieval foot combat without actually getting killed. Mm -hmm. And the way you do that is to really fight using real armor and fake weapons. Mm -hmm. So the weapons are about right in terms of weight and balance, though not very precisely, but they're made of rattan, not of steel, so they don't have cutting edges, and you're wearing a steel helmet and various other sorts of armor. So it's pretty close to being hit over the head with a baseball bat, although it's a little less rigid than a baseball bat. Uh, but it's being hit over a steel helmet right. to protect you with padding in between so it doesn't, in fact, hurt you. Uh, but it's fun. Yeah. It's, there are various ways in which it's not a very good recreation of what really happened. And that's especially true for the group fighting, because one of the essential features of real warfare is that people don't want to die. And therefore, if you think about a real battle, at the point when you think, if I stay here and keep fighting, I'm going to get killed, you're quite likely to run away. Whereas in SCA combat, 
getting killed heroically is just fine. You'll right. get up again after you're killed. Uh, and therefore, I think a good deal of the elements of real combat get missed. I'm really thinking as an economist, if you right. think about the incentive structure in combat. Uh, and there probably are ways that one could do better, that one could have some set of rules in which, as it were, there is a cost to you of getting killed in the in the battle, uh, and you sort of win if you, not only if your side wins, but if you survive. Uh, but I don't know if anybody has done a good job of that. That would be a sort of a fun project to try. If you think about modern fencing, modern fencing, in fact, has a solution, though not a very good solution to that problem, which is called right of way. That the basic rule is that under certain circumstances, I'm not allowed to attack until I've deflected your attack. Mm -hmm. And that reflects the fact that in the real world, I'm not willing to die myself in order to kill you. Uh, whereas in a sport, well, that's better than losing. Right. It would be a sort of a half, it would be a, a draw, as it were. Uh, so so as I, I'm not a fencer, but, but my understanding of fencing is they do have rules which are an attempt to solve part of that problem. And again, as an economist, I find the whole issue of how you set up a game so the same thing will happen as if it were real to be an intriguing puzzle. Right. Uh, didn't you write a paper on like the legal systems of like Iceland uh, some I, time ago? I, a long time ago, I wrote a paper on that, but I now have a book that just encompasses that. came out. And one chapter is, I hope, a much improved version of that paper because I found some things I was wrong about and other things I now know more about than I did then. Mm -hmm. But the book is on legal systems very different from ours. The basic idea is that all human societies face about the same problems, that they solve them in a wide variety of different ways, and that they are all grown-ups. And therefore, you should take all of them seriously as one possible way in which human beings figured out how to deal with the various problems the legal system deals with and try to understand how it worked, try to figure out why it worked the way it did, what problems it had, how they dealt with it, and so forth. And this book covers 13 different legal systems. 11 of them are ones that I wrote the chapter on, and I also have two co-authors, each of whom wrote one chapter each. That Peter Leeson, who has a very interesting book on 18th century pirates, wrote a chapter on their legal system. Mm. and. David Scarbeck, who has a very interesting book on prison, modern prison gangs, wrote a, system, wrote a, book, wrote a chapter on their, their legal system. And I did the other 11, which start with Imperial China, which was a system that survived for about 2,000 years with mm. the occasional intermissions when it broke down for a while. And I tried to understand that system. Uh, and then go on. I, I cover modern Amish, for example, who have their own legal system. Modern Romani I've have their own. I heard you talk on the Amish at uh, Porkfest a couple of years ago. Very right. likely. That was uh, a very well enlightening one. Yeah. But you know, that was probably talking about what ended up in this book. I taught a course on this for a long time every other year at Santa Clara University School of Law. And so I eventually turned my notes for the course into a book. <coughs> and it's a lot of fun. Uh, the part that's probably most interesting to libertarians is the discussion of what I call feud law, where I guess at least three of the societies I describe in this, probably more than that, maybe four, have some version of feud law. Uh, and the basic rule of feud law is that if you wrong me, I threaten to harm you unless you compensate me. And so it's a system which law enforcement is private and decentralized. And I have a chapter, <coughs> sorry, discussing what the problems are that such a system faces and how the various real world societies dealt with those problems. And since that's essentially a stateless system, it's of interest to modern people who like the idea of stateless societies or find them interesting. And Iceland, saga period Iceland right. is one of them. Iceland about a thousand years ago. Uh, Northern Somalia is another. Uh, to a considerable extent, the Romani, including the modern Romani, uh, actually used feud to settle their conflicts. Uh, the Comanche were essentially an anarchist society uh, running a feud system, and there are probably some other examples. And I argue what I think is true, though I'm not sure, that most legal systems started out as feud law, 
and then we're built on top of it. And I provide some evidence from at least Islamic law and Jewish law that they've got in them what I think of as fossilized feud. That is legal rules, which look as though they are the leftovers from a right. time when the legal system was privately enforced. Uh, and I also have a chapter on 18th century English criminal law, which was publicly enforced but privately prosecuted. So that uh, you, there were essentially no equivalent of our police and public prosecutors in England until the 19th century. And if you are the victim of a crime, it's up to you to, or to hire someone to right. do it, to figure out who did it, bring the evidence to court, and get him convicted. And that's true of our modern tort system. If somebody damages your car, you don't call the cops, you call a lawyer. But of course, with the tort system, if you win the case, he owes you damages. In the a English criminal system, if you win the case, they hang him, right. or other possible outcome, but you don't get anything. So part of the puzzle that made it an interesting chapter is what was the incentive? Why did people who were the victims of crime, in fact, go to the trouble of getting somebody uh, convicted? Uh, so that's not quite an anarchist system, but it's got elements of it since the par a part of, the, of what we assume is the job of the government was being done privately. Right. Uh, and that's, that's, that's interesting. So I had a lot of fun in this, in writing this book and learning stuff about a whole bunch of different societies. Uh, the obvious problem is that I can't really know enough to do it right, that mm -hmm. thoroughly understanding imperial China as a society is sort of a life's work, similarly for most of the other systems. What I tried to do with some success was to write a chapter and then find somebody who really was an expert on the subject and ask mm -hmm. him to tell me what I had wrong. Uh, so that the 18th century English one was one of the most successful, that I, in fact, was corresponding with someone who probably was the leading world's expert on that subject at the time. He's no longer alive, and he was very helpful. That was great. And to some degree, I managed that with, with Jewish law. I actually, quite, quite late, when I was almost finished, I got a response from somebody giving a very detailed discussion both of things he thought I had wrong and of things we thought there was more evidence in favor of what I was arguing, mm -hmm. which was sort of nice. Uh, but I'm sure there are still things in the book that are wrong. That is, right. uh, the, the, these are a whole bunch of very different societies. But I think, I, I think most of it is probably right, and I know a lot more than I did 15 years ago. I've that. certainly uh, learned a lot more reading your <laughs> stuff, especially uh, you had one section on, um, I think some other papers maybe on terms of uh, gypsy law and how they kind of resolve. Right. The currently, at least, Romani activists like to be called Romani, not gypsies. Mm. And there are two reasons for that. One of them is that many people think of gypsy as a negative term. And I don't, but that's common enough. Right. And the other is that the term gypsy is really used a bit more broadly, so that we think of gypsy as a lifestyle. And there are, for example, the Irish travelers who are not Romani. They, are, they have no ethnic connection with most of the people we call gypsies, but they have a lifestyle that you would describe as gypsy and therefore get confused with it. So I've generally gone, oh, I, I call them gypsies at the, in the early drafts, but I've gone to referring to them as Romani. Yeah. And they're a very interesting, especially interesting case. The, the Romani left India about a thousand years ago and they dispersed. So you've got... Uh, Romani societies in different parts of the world which are coming out of the same original culture but have been separated for hundreds of years and have developed in different ways. And that was sort of part of the fun of it. So I actually look at three different Romanis uh, at, at the, the Vlachram, who are the descendants of the Romani who were ensurfed in Romania for 400 years. That's the biggest group actually. The Romanichal who are the major English Romani group and the, now I'm not even remembering the name, but, but, but the Finnish uh, Romani, uh, who are again a very different group. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was interesting, trying to see how they differed and try to see if you could make plausible guesses right. about why they had developed in the ways they did. Uh, I think you had a good section with the Iceland one in terms like you're, you're talking about how people don't want to escalate a lot of violence. It was very costly. I think. Who, what the equivalent of that would be for our society or something like our society. And that's what my book, The Machinery of Freedom, came out of, right, where, well, where, where, where I 
1972, I think, is the copyright of the first edition. 89 is the second edition, and 2000 and something is the third. I think you wrote something about the effect that if you kill someone in a battle, you had to pay uh, for for the life or the cost of... uh, most of, Most of what's happening, except in the very late period, is not what we would think of as battles. It's mostly... You know, one to ten people on a side right. kind of scale, and the part of the problem on the Icelandic chapter is that we really have two different sources, and they aren't consistent with each other. Mm-hmm. So that my original article was based almost entirely on the sagas, which are basically histories and historical novels uh, written down in the 13th and 14th century. And one group of them, the so-called family sagas, deal with events that are mostly in the 10th century, some of them in the early 11th century. And then there's another group that deals with 13th century, mainly 13th century events. So one source is the sagas, and they describe what happened. Mm -hmm. And the other source is a collection of legal texts from the end of the period or just after the period. And they're not really the equivalent of a statute book. That doesn't seem to have existed, but they are... Some someone, we don't know who's, no, detailed notes on what the law is. Right. And we've got two such sources. And the trouble, that's called Gragas, is the term for that collection. And Gragas is in some ways inconsistent with the sagas. Hmm. So if you believe Gragas, if you and your friends attack me and my friends, we don't have to pay for killing you. You have fallen with forfeit immunity because you're the aggressors. If you look at the sagas, however, we generally do have to pay for killing you. So it's possible that Gragas is just wrong, that Gragas was how somebody thought the law ought to be, not how it was. It's possible that Gragas was the law on paper, but not how it actually worked out in practice. Uh, But certainly it's true that killing people was expensive. Uh, And there is, in fact, a scene in Njal Saga where you've got... Gunnar, who's a great hero, and his brother, who's pretty good, and they've been attacked by a group of people and have killed several of them, and the rest are running away, and his brother says, you know, let's chase them and kill some more, and and Gunnar says, no, our purses will empty already by the number Mm -hmm. we've killed. And so, now that's an odd case because they're the defenders, but at least in the saga, it's pretty clearly implied you're going to end up having to pay Wehrgeld for those. Uh, So that obviously limits the amount of, of violence in practice, because it gets expensive. Right. And there's another scene actually in the same saga, in Yal Saga, uh, where you've got things have broken down badly enough that it looks as though you're going to have fighting in the open air courtroom, which is uh, in Thing Bettler, where they all thing met. And somebody on one side goes to a sort of friendly neutral and says, if it does come down to fighting, what will you do to help us? And he says, tell you what, uh, I will... Uh, draw my ma- my people up armed over there. And if you're losing, you can retreat behind them and they won't want to attack us. Hmm. And if you're winning, we'll break up the fight before you kill more men than you can afford. Hmm. <laughs> so the implication is that even when things are going pretty badly, eventually when the smoke clears, you'll pay for it. Right. And the, in a sense, oddest bit is that the, la- the sagas that are the late period, the Sterling period, This is a period when the system is breaking down very badly, when essentially it's becoming a sort of off-and-on kind of many-sided civil war. That in the in the early period, conflict is generally about specific things. You know, I think you've wronged me, and and so forth. Whereas at the end, it really looks like you've got several factions who want to end up as king of Iceland. uh, In effect, though nobody actually does, they end up turning it over to Norway instead. Uh, But even then, it looks as though eventually after killing somebody you usually have to pay it, pay for it right. and i think part of the reason is that the person you kill is going to have kinsmen you they may be neutral if you kill their relative and don't pay damages they're likely to come in on the side against you right. even if they're on the enemy side the coalitions keep resorting and you'd like to be able to attract them next time around as it were so there's one rather funny in a sense scene where uh, there's been an attack on a house in which they eventually set the house on fire and some people inside it are killed. And later there's sort of a settlement, an agreement on, you know, who owes what to whom. And they agree to pay for some of the people they've killed, but they say so-and-so, we're not willing to pay for him. 
We offered to let him come out, and he refused. We offered to pay him to come out, and he refused. <laughs> We're not liable for, for killing him. Uh, so again, it's quite interesting. And yeah. if you look even in Sterling period, which is when things are pretty grim, the normal outcome of a battle with maybe 80 people aside is that a couple of the leading people on the losing side get executed, and everybody else they send home. Mm. Uh, so, so it's an interesting system. I think it's definitely fascinating because there's uh, a lot of Viking shows now today. So there's definitely like some interesting renewal uh, interest in how they lived. Uh, there's like five I could probably name off the top of my head towards that. But of course, Viking is a profession, not a nationality. Right. <laughs> so that some of the Icelanders were also Vikings, some of them weren't. That right. was a uh, question of what they happened to have done. Uh, but, but the Icelanders are our best literary source for that period because uh, they wrote what we call, we get our word saga from a body of literature written in Iceland in the 13th and 14th century, some of which involves events in Iceland and some of which events elsewhere, especially Norway, which they were cl most closely involved with. And that's really most of our inside picture of Viking period Norse society. Uh, and it's a very interesting picture. Uh, we obviously also have accounts of that from people who they were fighting with. Right. Uh, you made an interesting uh, distinction a couple of years ago because I was a criminal justice student at VCU in Richmond. So I read thoroughly through your works. It helped me with a lot of my arguments with my teachers. Uh, and one point that I really liked that you made a distinction was that there really shouldn't be a separation of uh, criminal justice and private justice in terms of, like the courtroom. They should all just be, it's the same thing, right? It should be just be one court. too strong. I spend a chapter in my book, Law's Order, discussing what I think of as the crime tort puzzle. Mm -hmm. That why do legal, modern legal systems have two mechanisms for doing about the same work? One of them is criminal law and one of them is tort law. Right. And I then raise the question of how you could modify tort law so that all everything that's now criminal is treated as tort. Right. And that raises some problems and then there are ways of solving those problems and those solutions raise further problems. So it's quite a complicated and interesting discussion. And then the flip half of that is if you do have criminal law and tort law, why do they differ in the ways they do? And that's, again, not obvious. You can sort of try to come up with plausible explanations, but you're not sure that why is it that for uh, criminal law you require proof beyond a reasonable doubt, for tort law you require proof by a preponderance of the evidence, which is much weaker. Why is it that for criminal law you... Uh, normally uh, require intent, and for tort law, you don't require intent. Right. Uh, now, all of these terms are oversimplifications, that there are, in fact, strict liability crimes. There are things where you don't have the intent, but you still get convicted of a crime. The obvious example of that would be statutory rape, where even if the man does not know that the woman is below age, even if he has no way of knowing it, he's still committed a crime. But mostly, you're supposed to actually intend to commit the crime in order to, to commit it. And you get a lot of interesting parallels in other legal systems. So that, for example, in Islamic law, one of the things everybody knows about Islamic law is that you cut the right hand off of a thief. Right. But if you actually look at the doctrine, it's much more complicated than that. Because first, they have to steal more than a certain amount. Second, they have to steal stuff that is guarded. So if you steal cattle grazing in a field, that's still a crime, but it's not the crime you get your right hand cut off for. Hmm. Uh, it's not the hot offense of, of theft. But you also have not committed that if you have some reason to believe you have a claim to the property, even if you're wrong. Hmm. So that's getting close to the intent kind of distinction. Right. That, And I gather that some, though not all, legal scholars held that stealing from the Muslim treasury did not count as the had offense of theft because the theft the thief could reasonably believe that he was part owner of the Muslim treasury as one of the Muslims and therefore he was only taking his own stuff. Uh, but there are various other cases. So a lot of the fun really is looking at parallelism among different systems. So that for example, one of my chapters is entitled When God is the Legislature, or maybe legislator. And the problem is if you have a system like Jewish law or Islamic law where you believe the law comes from divine revelation, what happens if God got it wrong? What happens if you have a legal rule that you're pretty sure you shouldn't have? 
or a legal rule that maybe made lots of sense a thousand years ago but makes no sense now. And in both Islamic law and Jewish law, probably most obviously in Jewish law, there are all sorts of ways of working around that kind of system. And I then suggest that American constitutional law really raises many of the same issues, that mm. we don't quite say the Constitution was written by God. And it is possible to change it, but it's very hard to change right. it. And therefore, just like a rabbi trying to work around uh, what's in the Old Testament, uh, the s constitutional scholar or the Supreme Court judge, justice, has got to make some plausible argument saying, well, the right way of interpreting this is the way I want to interpret it, not what it actually says. Right. Uh, so there are a lot of parallelisms. Similarly, Brian Kaplan, I gave, gave, gather, gave a talk here on his arguments about education. And one of the puzzles in imperial Chinese law is the examination system, that essentially there was a system of three levels of exams in imperial China. And if you passed the first level, you got a sort of a high status, but not much other than that. If you passed the second level, you were quite likely to get an important government job. And if you passed the third level, you were virtually certain to. Hmm. The pass rate at the second level was about 1%, wow. maybe 2%. So these were enormously difficult exams where people would take them over and over again, sort of year after year, study for years, and maybe get through the system in their 30s. Wow. This, among other things, was how you get the district magistrate, who is basically the combined judge, mayor, chief of police for a population of maybe 50,000 people or 100,000 people. However, the tests are not testing what you would think are the relevant skills for a district magistrate. They're testing basically how well you know uh, classical Chinese literature, mm. whether you can compose verse, whether you have beautiful calligraphy, uh, whether you can write essays on some topic where the essay is supposed to use the classical literature, uh, largely philosophy, uh, to defend some position or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then the puzzle is, why do you have a whole lot of the most talented people in the society spending a decade or more right. learning this stuff? And as I point out in the chapter, it's not clear we don't have the same system. And this is really Brian's argument, that to get most high-status jobs in the US, you need to have graduated from college. A large part of what you study in graduate from college has nothing at all, all to right. do with the job you're going to do. So it really raises exactly the same puzzle. Mm. And I offer some possible explanations in the Chinese case and then discuss to what degree those explanations might work in the modern American case. So I think the way I put it is the imperial exam system is alive and well in America. Uh, <laughs> so that was sort of part of the fun, looking at the parallelisms. Right. And there are a bunch of other cases where you can say the logic of the way this society handled this problem was the same as the logic. I'll give you a different example, which is one that I touch on, and that's the Visigothic law of torture. Visigoths are one of the Germanic peoples that seized part of the Roman Empire. They were ruling Spain for a while. And the Visigothic law code is the earliest of the Germanic law codes that we actually have a text for. And one of their rules was that if somebody's accused of a serious crime, and the judge concludes that he has not, not have enough evidence to either convict or acquit, he can torture the, the defendant. Hmm. But he can only torture the defendant if there is some information that the defendant would have if he was guilty and wouldn't have if he wasn't guilty. Hmm. Because that way, when under torture he confesses, you know whether he confesses because he's really guilty or just confesses because he's being tortured. Right. And that was you know, a not implausible way of trying to solve there's the problem, lots of legal systems have used torture. And the problem, of course, is that you're afraid that people will confess to things they didn't do if you're torturing them. This is an issue that arises in Athenian law as well, as it turns out. Uh, but it's essentially the same system we use. We don't put it in terms of torture. But in deciding whether a confession is good evidence, one of the criteria is, does the confession show knowledge that the guilty perpetrator would have and that an innocent perpetrator wouldn't have? And in both cases, there's the same problem. And the problem is that if the people who are torturing you are sure they're guilty or you're guilty or if they're sure they want you to be convicted, they can feed you the information. You then give it back. They don't say they fed it to you, and therefore it looks as though that's evidence. And I think right. that 
probably happens sometimes in our system, and it happens, happen, I suspect, though I don't know, in their system. But again, it's one of many cases where you've got a similarity between two different legal systems raising the same issues. And I would say uh, your description of um, polycentric legal systems in terms you see a worldwide competing legal systems would be, in a way, anarchy. Uh, in a way that you have competing services that have not been monopolized uh, by that state. Is, that is, the legal system that I sketch in Machinery of Freedom is a polylegal system uh, in that it's one in which what the legal rule is between me and you is not necessarily the same as the legal rule between me and her or me and him, uh, depending on what, what rights enforcement agencies we're customers of. And that's been true in various ways of a number of historical legal systems that I discuss. Uh, it was true of traditional Islamic law because even among Sunni Muslims, there were and still are four different schools of law, which in general agree but disagree on a variety of the details. And under some circumstances, if we signed our contract under in a Shafi'i court, then the contract gets decided by Shafi'i law. And if it was in one of the other three madabs, uh, it would be decided under their law. Mm -hmm. And there are then problems that arise in cross cases. Uh, if I'm the, I, I follow one of the schools of law and you follow a different, what happens in a case between us and how that gets resolved is going to depend on the system. The answer might be you go to the defendant's court, which would discourage litigation. Right. It might be the cross cases go to the court that the ruler prefers, uh, might be some other solution. Uh, but anyway, no, I found it very interesting, and parts of it are relevant to anarcho-capitalism, parts of it are relevant to lots of other things. It's I don't really think of this as a libertarian book, but only a book that libertarians should find interesting. Well, a, a history book, I think it kind of relates a lot to it's politics. It's not only history, because the, the Amish are still around. The Romani are still around. <laughs> Uh, so it's it's a bunch of legal, for that matter, Jewish law and Islamic law are still right. around. Well, Islamic neither is is around in its in a full version. That it's been co-opted, I would say, by states. Right. That is to say, Jewish law still applies to issues like marriage, a uh, number of other issues, largely just enforced in the conscience. Uh, there may be some cases that would be enforced in a court. Uh, Islamic law, none of the Islamic governments at present is really following Islamic law. What they are doing is incorporating parts of Islamic law into a statute law system. But traditional Islamic law was not a statute law system. Right. One of the doctrines was separation of law and state. It was a system where the law was deduced by scholars from religious sources. Uh, and then, in theory, at least, the judge who the ruler appointed was supposed to follow what the religious scholars said the law was, not what the ruler said the law was. I, I sometimes say it's what our system would be if law professors ran the world, oh. because <laughs> journal articles rather than Supreme Court cases right. would then be used as precedent. Uh, so would you say uh, you're an anarcho-capitalist? Oh, yeah, sure. And how would you define uh, anarchy or anarcho-capitalism? I would define... That's a somewhat complicated question. That is a simple answer is that an anarchy is a society without a government. And then you get into the much harder question of why do we call some organizations governments and some not governments. And to answer that, my the third edition of my first book, Machinery of Freedom, has a chapter which tries to answer that question. Uh, but I don't think it's worth trying to do it yeah. in the context of the interview. So, but the definition is no government. And the, the capitalism part is that in a society, any society has to have some way of coordinating people, some way of making sure that if I'm making cars, someone else is making enough steel, and if he's making steel, someone else is, making, is mining enough iron ore and right. coal and so forth. They've got a very complicated set of people whose actions are all interacting. And there are only two basic solutions to the coordination problem, and one of them doesn't work. Uh, the one that doesn't work is the obvious one, which you have somebody at the top telling everybody what to do. And that works for very small organizations, but it doesn't work on the scale of a nation state, as the Soviet Union demonstrated, right. or works very badly. And the other is some decentralized system along the general lines of private property and exchange. 
and anarcho-capitalists are people who imagine their stateless society being coordinated in the latter method way. So it's a stateless society with some sort of institutions of private property in exchange. Right. Uh, as opposed to other kinds of anarchists who imagine some other system of coordination. How do you define then uh, a state? Well, the definition I gave in the first edition of my book is an agency of legitimized coercion. And I then tried to explain that I was really using invented meanings for both words. Mm. That what I meant by legitimized was not a moral statement. It was a state and all people reacted to it. Right. So you that if moral statements, I would say, it's mostly, mostly consequential. So, so, so that if if somebody grabs your wallet, it seems natural to run after him, yelling "Stop thief!" Mm -hmm. If the IRS seizes your bank account, it does not seem natural to run after them, yelling "Stop right. thief!" So that whether or not you believe it's morally legitimate, you treat it as if it was legitimate. Mm -hmm. And I the chapter discusses in much greater length what I think is really going on there, which involves a set of commitment strategies with which we defend our, our rights and that government is the organization against which we drop the commitment strategies, the willingness to fight very hard for something that we would normally use. So that's what I mean by legitimized. By coercion, I am again not offering a moral theory. I am saying that any particular society, there will be a set of activities which are thought of as rights violation. Part of the way you can tell that they are thought of as rights violation is when you do them, people yell stop thief or they fight you or they do various extreme things against them. Uh, and they'll fight you even if the cost of the fight is somewhat more than what you stole. Right. Uh, and that whatever that society's view of rights are, governments can violate them and not, not provoke the kind of response that you expect from rights violations. Right. So that's the closest I can come to giving a definition of government. Because there isn't, I can't think of any activity that is done only by governments. That any of the things governments do, at some time or place, somebody else has done them we wouldn't think of as a government. War making, for example. Right. Uh, if you look at uh, Anglo-Saxon England at the time of Alfred the Great, the armies, uh, the, the, the Norse armies that were, the Danish was the term they usually used. Yeah. They might weren't necessarily Danes that were attacking England, as far as I can tell, were not national armies. They were entrepreneurial projects. Right. That basically some leader with a good reputation would say, hey guys, let's get together a whole bunch of people and attack Anglo-Saxon England. It's Guthrie, or Guthrie, Gu well, it, it, Guthrum is the one who, who supposedly Alfred fights, but right. there are a bunch of different people. Yeah. But in each case, we're going to attack them. With luck, we'll get loot. Maybe we'll get slaves. Maybe we'll seize some land. Maybe they'll pay us to go away. Right. Uh, but it was not really a government. I don't think they thought saw themselves as a government. Uh, so, and certainly we've had lots of law enforcement that's private in various contexts and mm -hmm. so forth. So I think you can't define government by what it does. Uh, you can't do it by collecting taxes because, after all, burglars take stuff from you without your permission too. Right. Uh, so I think the definition really comes down to the fact that they do the sorts of things that we normally see as rights violation and get away with it without provoking the kind of response you would normally have. Right. Uh, Where would you say, because uh, I, I read your blog, you yeah. know, good comments on like uh, global warming, for example, yeah. you provide a lot of good citations and sources with that. Uh, I find it interesting your, uh, uh, the things you had to say about Rothbard as well. And earlier today there was a, a dinner thing, a lunch thing, talking about whether you hate the state uh, so I'm kind of curious, I guess, to elaborate or learn more about... I, you haven't read enough of my blog, okay. <laughs> because I, I had an old blog entry years ago responding to that essay by Rothbard, right. and that Rothbard's argument was that what was wrong with me because I didn't hate the state. And he's right, that it's not right that it's wrong with me, but he's right that I don't hate the state, that I regard the state as an intellectual error, not a act of deliberate evil. And it might not be an error. Maybe I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe we really can't maintain an anarchy, in which case, and lots of smart people think I'm wrong. Uh, so it's a matter of people who have a different. If if I really believed that if there was no government at all, we would be conquered by bad guys, or we would be prey to all sorts of criminal gangs, and I'd be in favor of government too. So I don't see it as uh, evil. And what I, the point I made in the blog post is that the trouble with Rothbard's position is that all's fair in love and war. And consequently, if you really believe that it's a matter of good against evil, you aren't very scrupulous about your methods. And in my view, Rothbard was willing to make what he 
at some level knew were bad arguments I've read that in book. order to convince people. In terms of uh, Reagan. Was, uh, I book. gave one example there and another example in economic in history of economic thought where I think he attacks Adam Smith in a way that I don't believe can be defended. Mm -hmm. uh, the particular example is, now Adam, Smith was not an anarchist, of course. Right. He was a libertarian. Uh, but Rothbard says, look, Adam Smith proposed an export tax on wool. This clearly shows he's, he's not a, in favor of liberty. Rothbard does not tell you, and Smith does tell you in great detail, that at the time it was illegal to export wool, that it was illegal to transport wool near the coast under circumstances in which you might be planning to smuggle it away. Mm. So you had sort of the equivalent of our war on drugs, as it were, in an attempt to prevent the export of English wool on entirely bogus grounds, as far as you can tell. And Smith said, repeal that and replace it with just a tax on exporting wool. So it's as if somebody 100 years from now said, you realize that so-and-so was pro-government, why he wanted to tax marijuana. Right. And he doesn't explain that this was a proposal to legalize marijuana uh, with a sales tax on it. Right. Uh, so that would be one example where I think he pretty clearly knows what answer he wants to get and is not scrupulous about how he gets it. And as I say, I think once you're, when you think of the world in terms of a war rather than an argument, well, it's natural enough not to be very scrupulous in wartime. You do make, you come from the Chicago School of Economics. Yes. Uh, and I guess the, what do you say, is pragmatic or just a consequentialist approach in terms of when they look at uh, state economics? Because like they invited them to Chile, for example, and you find that if you were to do certain things in the economy or for the state to do certain things, uh, things will go in a different direction, and which is what... Uh, but, but an Austrian could say that, too. Okay. That is, it's not, that's really, I think, insofar as there are distinctions between Chicago School and Austrian, it's really methodology hmm. that, you know, Mises was not an anarchist. Uh, Mises even wrote uh, in at least one of the editions of Human Action that those who at the present time oppose conscription and taxation are the enemies perhaps the unknowing enemies of liberty. That's not an exact quote, but it's pretty close. Oh, I've never uh, heard that. Okay. Yeah, and uh, the, so, so I don't think the Austrian versus Chicago school is really an anarchist versus limit gov limited government distinction. It's a distinct, it's a disagreement on how you do economics and different Austrians hold different versions of that. Right. I think your history or an area of your, your study of, or how you came here, I think is fascinating. Uh, I think your father, uh, Milton Friedman, in terms of uh, arguing down government to like a minimal area, how did you uh, follow that up to want to push that further or where does that interest uh, come from? Well, that is, he thought that the best you could do was a small government, a sort of classical liberal kind of position, which yeah. is roughly police courts and national defense. And that was my view, I suppose, as a teenager. And I wasn't entirely happy with that position because I didn't see how the government made a law affected what was right or wrong. Uh, and eventually, essentially, my, my, my consequentialist view at the time was that the framework of law had to be provided from the outside by the government. And then within that framework, you would have laissez-faire. And I thought you could prove that. I didn't really have a written out proof, but it seemed to me sort of obvious that one couldn't provide the framework endogenously, provide the framework inside the system. And what persuaded me I was wrong about that was a science fiction novel by Heinlein called The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Now, if I'd known all the stuff in this, I might have been persuaded <laughs> that way too, but that was this was when I was, I don't know, 20 or something, right. maybe younger than that. And in Moon, Heinlein gives a believable description of a stateless society. It's in his story, the moon has been used the way Australia was as a penal colony. And once you've lived on the moon for a while, you can't go back because you've adapted to low gravity. So over time, you accumulate a population on the moon who are legally free. They've served out their time or they're the children of, of people who were sentenced to, to the, the penal colony. But there is no government there the only government structure is, in effect, the prison, and they're outside of it, and they've developed their own institutions. Mm -hmm. And the point is that it seems to me it was an internally consistent story of a society in which the legal framework itself was endogenous, itself was coming out of the people's voluntary interactions with each other. 
if that's possible, then there can't be any general theorem saying it's impossible. Right. So that got me interested in trying to think through addition. Uh, and so, so that was a matter of my trying to sort of imagine and overly construct. And to some extent, the research that produced this present book, I concluded that I've been reinventing the wheel because a good deal of what I had really was a fancier version of what some past societies had done. Uh, but that was a society in which law and law enforcement were themselves produced on the market rather than imposed from the outside. Right. So you come here through like through the arguments, as you're mentioning. Yeah. I think that's uh, phenomenal. I'm a big fan of uh, your work. I look forward to reading your next one. Legal system is very different from <laughs> ours. Uh -huh. uh, and thanks very much for having this interview, having this talk. Thank you for yeah. interviewing me. Yeah. And uh, please continue being a champion of freedom. <laughs> I will do what I can.